Hi everyone, we're going to be talking about stress and stress management today, a subject for better or worse we all know pretty well. First, we want to talk about what is stress? How would we define it? Now many of you have your own definitions and those will stay and I'll tell you why that that's important. We all have our own experiences with stress. But generally, stress is defined as the anxious or threatening feeling that we experience when we interpret or appraise a situation as being more than our physiological or bodily resources can adequately handle, i.e., when we are faced with something that we feel we cannot physically, maybe emotionally, handle at that time. Stress ultimately then is what is the wear and tear on our body after that experience. The wear and tear on our mind and our spirit brought on by our own reactions to these events in life. Life is full of stress, but the stress response is the end result of many complex interactions within our body, between the individual, us, and our world. So really stress is not only the experience of stress in our body and our brain, but it's also what happens after it and how we either cope with it or it maybe develops and builds up in our system, developing maybe chronic health conditions, ways of coping with stress that could be unhelpful or really helpful ways of coping with stress. Stress is all of this and more. Additional perspective I like to share with you all is how stress is adaptive and universal. It really varies between individual, how much stress you may experience and how you may react to the stress. For example, you might react to different experiences or perceive an event as more or less stressful than your neighbor. You might be exposed to different stressors growing up. You might be not very exposed to certain stressors that your neighbor might have been exposed to. The way you experience and therefore cope with stress can be adaptive as well as different from your neighbor and your peers. I want you to consider how stress may be also this evolutionary adaptation that we have developed. This is a very important consideration as it allows our body to learn that stress is important to respond to and to listen to. Let's say we have our ancestors, they might be hunter gatherers and there's this big bear that comes into their cave or into their area. The important thing about stress is their body needs to see that bear as a absolute threat and a stressor and their body's going to go into what is a natural response or evolutionarily developed response of fight or flight. The adrenaline in their body goes up, potentially cortisol goes up, their blood pressure increases, their heart rate increases, blood is flowed directly to their muscles and away from their things like their, their stomach or their digestive tract because they need to focus on surviving. Adaptation to stress allows us to survive as a species and therefore it has become a universal adaptation for us all. However, a big difference between that story and now is no bear is going to walk into this conference room or wherever you may be watching this presentation, ideally. And so therefore, when we're driving to work and we find ourselves in a really bad traffic jam or someone cuts us off in front, um, a car cuts us off in front of us, or we find ourselves managing a stressful uh, family dynamic, the unfortunate thing is these are not bears but our body is reacting to them as if they are. And some individuals might be reacting more than others because of various factors that they have been given through biological or genetic considerations, psychological or mental health considerations, as well as their social upbringing. It's very important to understand that some people may be exposed or less exposed to stressors or witness how stress is, is experienced in different ways. All in all, it's really important to understand and accept that stress is part of us and is actually a good thing to keep us alive. But nowadays, we don't have many bears coming to, to come kill us. So how do we adapt to stress that is appropriate and in a way that keeps us alive in 2024 and beyond? So why are we talking about stress when it comes to cardiac rehab? How does it affect our cardiac and circulatory health? Stress can impact our circulatory and cardiac health in many different ways. 
As you may have learned through other lectures and presentations, there are various factors in our life that can affect our cardiovascular system, including diet, genetics, exercise, and yes, even stress. In very simplified terms, stress can increase our blood pressure and general inflammation across the body. This results in negative changes to our circulation systems and even results in heart rhythm difficulties. Overall, the more that our systems are inflamed and overworked by stress, among other reasons, the more risk someone is to have a cardiac event or develop chronic cardiac conditions. Now, stress response happens in various systems. As I had briefly mentioned before, we have our body system, our physiological reactions. We have our cognitive reactions, so our brain, our thinking, our processing. We have our emotional reactions, so how we display this, how we experience the stressors. Does it affect your mood? Does it affect your behavior? Which is the last piece, which is behavioral. How are we reacting to not only our body changes, our brain changes, our emotional changes, but how do we display that to the world? So I'm going to go through each one of these and see what fits for you. See what factors of stress response that you might be experiencing or have experienced in the past. First is that physiological response. This is the body reaction. When we feel stress, we might feel, oh my gosh, there's a bear coming in. And if a bear came in right now while you're watching this, this is likely how your body's going to respond. However, when you're sitting in traffic and you're feeling stress, that's not a bear. That's just traffic. But your body's going to maybe react similarly because that's how it's been taught. You might have adrenaline released, things like cortisol. Your blood pressure and heart rate goes up. Your breathing rate increases. You're trying to get more oxygen to those muscles. Your blood sugar is going to go up because it's going to send all of that to the different parts of your body so you can fight or flight. You can run away or fight this bear. But you also might release fatty acids, triglycerides, cholesterol into the bloodstream, which actually over time might also build up into things like plaque or affect your vascular system that you might increase over time as well, your blood pressure, because it has to push through those things. So really, perceiving a bear is helpful, but perceiving traffic as a bear isn't going to be helpful, but your body's going to react the same. Next is cognitive. This is the brain. Maybe you might struggle to concentrate. You're feeling so stressed you can't make decisions. Maybe you're having difficulty completing tasks. One thing, then the next, and the next. You can't focus. What am I supposed to do with that? How am I supposed to do with that? I'm worried. You feel this negative perception maybe of yourself or the world. You know, I'm not excited for things. I'm worried about things. And maybe even you start isolating and not acting like yourself. Maybe you're not laughing as much, or maybe you're not able to engage with others as much. You kind of isolate. And that's because maybe your brain and your thoughts are saying, this is really stressful. I am focusing on the stress, and stress is my only thing I can focus on right now. Emotional reactions to stress are slightly overlapping with our body and our brain because we can't separate those three. Our emotions are coming from reactions from our body as well as reactions from our brain. However, what they look like are things like anxiety, nervousness, just chronically worrying about something. Can I handle this? What am I going to do? Then there's depressed mood. What am I doing anymore? I can't manage this. I'm going to stay inside. I'm struggling. Who am I? I can't handle this. This overwhelming sense of worry and maybe depression can follow chronic stress and maybe even comes out in how you treat others or treat yourself. You might be irritable. You might struggle to fall asleep. You might have more anger. These are emotional reactions to how you experience or when you experience stress. Behavioral reactions to stress are the external factors that others might see. These are the changes in behavior that you might exhibit after or during a stressful experience. It might look like use of alcohol, drugs, tobacco to maybe cope or numb with the distress. Maybe it's changes in your eating or sleeping, increasing of nervous habits like nail biting or grinding your teeth, which ultimately may affect your sleep as well. Maybe it's angry outbursts or increased irritability, having a shorter temper with yourself, with people you love, because your brain and body are really focused on the stressful trigger. Avoidance of other people, maybe there's some 
isolation. You pull inward because you're really focused on how do I cope with this stressful experience going on? And then generally there might be a sense of reduced self-care. Maybe you're not doing your healthy habits or maintaining your routines. Maybe you're eating differently. Maybe you're simply sleeping more, all of the above. And this will look different to those in your life, but it also might negatively affect your physical and emotional health as well. So now we're going to talk about what can you actually do to help reduce and manage stress. We understand it's an adaptive thing for us. It's natural. It's universal. And there are ways to best manage it so we can keep living our lives in the healthiest and most authentic way possible. When we talk about stress management, it's not actually re removal of stress because, again, stress is natural. But really, it's more of a systematic, thoughtful approach to look at, modify, or eliminate the stressors as possible, building up personal resilience or ability to manage that stress. What are the coping skills I need? What are the coping skills I'm good at? Or what are the coping skills I want to practice more? Maybe there's other ways to balance the stress in your life. So maybe you can't get rid of the stress, right? You might always have the stress related to cardiac health or a family member or finances. This is natural and unfortunate, but it's what life might look like for a bit. So how do I balance that stress with positive self-care activities? Maybe I can do more value-oriented activities so I can balance out that distress. And then reducing the negative effect of stress. If you're coping with the stress the best you can, what can you add onto your plate that actually gives you a little bit more back? Some rejuvenation or relaxation to reduce the negative effects of stress on your body, your brain, and your emotional health. A significant piece of stress management is understanding what factors in your life are causing stress and how to modify or eliminate those stressors. Importantly, there are many things in our life that we can and cannot control. Most things in life we actually cannot control. Be it the bear that walks into our cave to the traffic jam in front of us as we're getting, we're going to work and we're late to work. Understanding what factors we can cope with as well as what factors we can change is a significant portion of stress management. In front of us, we have something called the serenity prayer. Some of you may have heard of this in other settings or support networks. And today we're just simply using it or suggesting it as a statement or motivating mantra for yourself when you're managing stress. It focuses on granting you the courage, the confidence to go towards and change the things that you can change when they're causing you stress. It also grants you the peace or serenity to accept the things that you cannot and the wisdom or understanding and ability to let go and know the difference between the two. Not only does it building up insight between what you can and cannot control in a stressful situation contribute to stress management, but it also contributes to a sense of confidence and ability to manage more stressors as you grow and as you develop and are exposed to more experiences. I would love for you all to take note of this serenity prayer and whatever pieces of it work for you or allow you to feel more confident and insightful in what causes you stress and being able to differentiate the two of the things that you can and cannot control. Next, I'm gonna talk about building stress resistance. Knowing what you are in control of is important for this, right? And knowing what you can do or what responsibility you have. So let's say you find a stressor that you know I can't change this, I can't get rid of it or eliminate it, but I can modify it. I can adapt to it. So using that brain of yours that is so well developed from our ancestors, what can I do at this time? What are the baby steps I can take? Are they positive health habits? Can I just inject a little bit more of a happy experience in my day? Is it walking more? Is it spending more time with my family? Value-oriented decisions. Is it simply taking a break when you need it? Is it giving yourself that grace and respect to say, this is a way I'm going to build up resistance against the stress that is ongoing. Give myself that grace and space. Or is it simply asking for more help, social support, getting some support from others and delegating 
could also be a form of resistance, knowing when do I need to modify my situation by bringing in the troops, bringing in the support systems. This could look like relaxation, rejuvenation, or value-oriented decisions, and I'm going to expand on that in the next two slides. But know that you can build up stress resistance even in the smallest and babiest of steps. It's all up to you, and that's actually a very cool and powerful experience in the face of high stress. Now that you've been able to identify, all right, I can't eliminate this. We're going to try to modify it and build up some resistance by injecting some positive experiences, coping mechanisms into my day. Now I'm going to figure out how do I balance and prioritize myself as I keep doing this? What is important to me during this stressful time? These decisions are going to be important also for your constant adaptation. Maybe the stressor will shift. It may increase or decrease. So how are you going to continue to adapt to this stressor and find balance? This is going to look similar to maybe how you would do so as an employee or as part of your family, the role that people rely on you for. These skills include planning, organizing, communicating effectively, setting limits with yourself and others, delegating, asking for help, and establishing external support systems. These are ways you can balance and prioritize yourself in the situation that you've said, I'm adapting as best I can, I'm eliminating the stressors I can, and I'm adding in values and relaxation and rejuvenation as much as I can. How do I continue to get this balance and prioritize myself? Look at these skills, again, as something like akin to a job. Take charge of it. Be in control. Last but not least, I would love to talk about relaxation, a subject we all have heard many a time in our life, as well as in the last few slides. I've mentioned it a lot. We hear relax and go to vacation, relax, or take a break, relax, you should relax. These are all things that we hear on a regular basis. And I don't know about you, but sometimes it feels absolutely impossible to do it. And even when I try to relax, it doesn't seem to help. There's a metaphor I like to use when describing how relaxation can actually be helpful and be rejuvenating versus when it's just a break that doesn't really give us anything back. I want you to imagine yourself, you're like your cell phone. And at the end of the day, you're noticing, wow, my cell phone's battery is going to die very soon. So one option is you just put it down and say, put it next to you on the table, bedside table, whatever. And you just leave it there and you're like, oh, I'm letting it rest. Perhaps you could even say it's relaxing on that table. Another option is you put it down, but you plug it in. You start to recharge it. The difference between these two is, yes, you're not using your phone. Yes, you're giving it a break, but only one of them is allowing it to actually recharge and rejuvenate. So the next time you pick it up, it's able to start where you need it to. When we say relax, we really want to encourage the rejuvenation side of this. What are factors or tools or trip tips that you can use to ensure that you're actually getting rejuvenation? Because when we do that, it results in things like reducing our bodily or physiological arousal. It really gives us a sense of mental clarity, actually reduces the perceived stress that we're experiencing. It actually is encouraging time out to feel like a time out, a rejuvenating break. And over time, we see it allows us to better appraise experiences, even stressful experiences, positively and with confidence. Rejuvenation and relaxation is like a feedback system. The more we do it, the more recharged we feel. There are many relaxation and rejuvenating techniques that we can teach you, that you can find online. There are breathing exercises, which are very important to regulate the CO2 and O2 balance in your body. There's progressive muscle relaxation to really feel the difference between tensed muscles, really stressed out muscles, and really relaxed muscles. There's meditation, which is a practice that's difficult, but also the whole point of it is to encourage you to reconnect with your body in the present moment, to really gain clarity during those relaxing and rejuvenating moments. There's guided imagery, imagery, so 
presenting yourself in your mind in your favorite spot or on the beach somewhere, rejuvenating and recharging in that mental image. And then there's positive self-talk. Sometimes people don't pay too much attention to positive self-talk because it's so easy to do negative self-talk. Somehow it's really hard to give ourselves the self-compassion and support we deserve. But the more we do that, just like we more we do any of these relaxation techniques, the more our body and brain are going to respond positively. So I want to thank you for listening and engaging with this presentation. And I want to leave you with three very important points. Stress is universal. There's a lot of factors to it, our body, our brain, our community, our upbringing, our ancestors. And what results is it's unique to each person. You can't compare yourself to your neighbor. All you can do is look to yourself and say, how am I going to cope with this? What can I do? How can I take control? And who can I ask for help? Stress, we found, does affect your heart and your cardiovascular system. There's a direct link of how our body and therefore our behavior changes when we're very stressed. So encouraging rest, relaxation, rejuvenation, and also stress management can not only help us in the moment emotionally, but also physically. And as I just mentioned, you can choose to react to imbalance to stress. You are in charge. You are able to adapt. It's part of your system, part of your genetic makeup. How you think about stress and what you do with it affects how you experience it. Reclaiming that control is a first incredible step for stress management. Please let us know if you have any questions by coming to the rehabilitation facility, talking to the behavioral health providers there, or simply talking to your family and friends about stress and how they might be managing it well. Thank you so much and have a good rest of your day.